Hypocrisy. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I'm your host, Nick Riccada of Riccada Law, a small law firm in Minnesota. Today is kind of the inaugural episode of something I teased a little while ago uh, called Direct Examination, where I invite a guest on and we pry deep into their darkest secret. Not really. <laughs> we get to know them a little bit, and I am really honored uh, to have my first guest on that show as Mr. Ed Greenwood. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. Well met. <laughs> well met to you too. Uh, and thank you so much for coming on. Um, if you guys do not know who Ed is, we're going to get into this. Uh, just, uh, I want to, I want to prime this. This is the first episode of this style of show. I want to prime this a little bit because I'm going to do it differently than my other shows. Uh, so this is going to be an interview and a discussion primarily between me and my guest. And so while I love Super Chats and grifting with all of my heart's desire, I'm going to ask that uh, for now, we kind of keep those to a minimum. Um, and if you do want to send them, I, of course, appreciate it, but I will probably not be getting to them until we get kind of through uh, the meat of the interview. And if we have some time to Q&A a little bit later, great. If not, uh, my apologies. But I, I don't want to, like, mislead anyone into thinking I'm going to be addressing Super Chats all throughout the interview. This is going to be kind of... Uh, our conversation on that, and I hope you'll uh, you'll you'll not hate me too much on that one. <laughs> but but with that, uh, Mr. Greenwood is the creator of the Forgotten Realms uh, Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting, which has kind of become the default D and D campaign setting, uh, and has been for quite some time. And um, most of the stuff you see about sort of mainstream D and D takes place in the Forgotten Realms, unless you see otherwise these days. And so, with that uh, kind of preface, I'm going to start this thing, and I'm going to cheekily and probably terribly do this kind of like a direct examination in court, and then I will hopefully forget that format because gimmicks are silly. But <laughs> Mr. Greenwood, uh, even though I have said it, please, uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, yeah, call me Ed. Um, <laughs> Mr. Greenwood, uh, until, you know, he died, uh, Mr. Greenwood was my dad. And, right. you know, I'd, I'd go to gaming conventions and someone would say, Mr. Greenwood, and I'd, my dad's here? And I'd look, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not used to it. Um, I'm, I'm just me. I'm Ed. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, I'm Nick. You can call me Nick or whatever other name you want. <laughs> I've, I've heard many of them and deserve most of them. <laughs> Learned counsel. Yeah. <laughs> not that one. Oh, no, not that one. There is one rule. Not not that one. <laughs> no, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, but yeah. So, <laughs> so let's let's kind of start back at the beginning. Now I cheated and did a tiny tiny amount of reading. Uh, about your backstory, but I tried to keep it minimal because I want to get the story from you, uh, not from like Wikipedia or comic book news or something like that. So um, let's start, which I don't think will actually be at the beginning, because you said to start now where the characters are and not start with old places and who begat, who begat, who begat. See, no, I've done, well, you know, done um, my research. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if if you if you read the Bible as literature, which I'm sure all of you do, um, uh, those begats are a hard 45 pages to get through. Whew. I mean, yeah. they were very useful to the tribes of Israel to keep the genealogy straight. But that's right. all it really is. So and so begat so and so begat so and so. I wanted the details. OK, who is a bad cook? Uh, right. who ran off with somebody else's wife um, or husband uh uh how, who had 42 children and they all look suspiciously like roman soldiers i want to know that <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's true and in true fashion of me you said something delightfully interesting that i want to explore on a tangent before we get back into this story you just said if you read the bible as literature can you expand upon that idea well ever since i've been born <laughs> since i've um <laughs> no one no one what was going on around me i've loved stories and mm. so i'm approaching any book any written book 
And, you know, I've sat in a lot of doctor's waiting rooms and I've leafed <laughs> through a lot of medical magazines that have absolutely gory photographs of skin right. growths and eruptions. And I'm reading this stuff and it's all in jargon because every profession invents its own jargon to keep outsiders at bay. So exactly. you're reading something that is not in every colloquial everyday English. And thank goodness it isn't, because it would date fast if it was. But I'm reading everything as story, as entertainment. What can this tell me about the world? And the Bible is no different. In fact, what the Bible really is, is uh, one of those huge fat anthologies that they used to be so popular in the 50s and 60s. Six right. new great locked room mysteries. Because what you've got is all these different books, as we call them. Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. Judges, whatever, which you shoved together. And somebody edited it, and they left a whole bunch of stuff out, the Apocrypha. You know, so, I mean, yeah, you really are reading an anthology of um, sometimes not very short stories. See, that that resonates heavily with me because uh, in, in my past life, um, I was, uh, someone was dumb enough to ask me, not really, that was rude. Someone was polite enough to ask me to um, teach to teach Bible study to teenagers. And one of the key things that I started to notice as I was forced to explore the Bible a little bit more and to apply my education, which prior to law was actually literature and creative writing, uh, mm -hmm. was the appearance of proto-genre, at least in my opinion, in biblical stories. And one of the things I tried to teach kids a little bit uh, from my lay perspective was to say, the reason that these stories stuck around is because they contained elements of storytelling that have persisted all the way through to today. So while these are important uh, biblical stories for your faith, for your, that faith foundation, we kind of have to look at them or not, not have to, but it's useful to look at them through a lens of genre and through a lens of story and storytelling. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, uh, and this this angers a lot of people. I apologize to all you Christians uh, who get mad at this, but um, to me, Jonah looks a lot like a satire. Yes, for example. Yeah, and and I don't think that that necessarily changes uh, the truth that we're supposed to derive from the story of Jonah, but it might challenge the historicity a little bit for the benefit of being a great story that lasts and, and is teachable to people regardless of circumstance. We can, we can analogize things uh, in, in similar with Genesis. We can anthropomorphize things to um, help people relate. Uh, is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about as well? Yeah, the, the, and, and I, I do this in the realms too. Uh, if, if you read the early Elminster novels, where Elminster is with all of these elves in Mithranor, Mm -hmm. And the elves are showing what we colloquially call human characteristics, you know, corruption, pride, sneering down um, at non-elves, you know, like uh, we pigeonhole and we stratify and I'm better than th those guys over there. And it's like I'm deliberately putting all those into my elven culture to show that we're not really that different. This is universal human um emotions, uh, behaviors, and so on. And yeah, uh, I, I'm always a little um, uh, leery of discussing any holy book because people get upset because it's part right. of their belief system. But that happened to be mine. Um, and in fact, there, there was published in the 1960s a James Bond book, which is one of these looks at all of his, his drinks, his guns, everything. And it had a fake cover, double-sided. You could rip off the cover and turn it or over and it said the bible designed to be read as literature so you could conceal <laughs> the fact from your friends that you were reading about james bond uh and and consider that you were cultural uh sure. and yeah so um that's always been my tagline ah the bible designed to be read as literature but yes yeah, some things are satire and other things show us just how far we've come because uh and again i'm going to apologize just as you did to the christians <laughs> who who might be upset by this but if you've ever seen Monty Python's um, Life of Brian yes, and the stoning scene, if you read Leviticus, you could say that must be a parody. Because if you read Leviticus literally, there'll be nobody left. Everybody yeah. will have stoned everybody for everything. Like, like you'd already be stoned because you obviously trim your beard. Yes, That's right. a stoning offense. 
Actually, I just have such low testosterone that my beard only grew to here and then stopped oh. immediately. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's between you and God. And therefore, right. yeah. I've yeah, had yeah. this since I was 16, but then it, it just stayed. But no, I'm I mean, kidding. <laughs> but I mean, all those guys I see on the sidewalk who shave their heads, oh, stoning offense. You know? Right. All and, this uh, stuff. <laughs> That's such a, it's an interesting concept and topic because uh, one of my, one of my very dear friends uh, who is, uh, he, he and his audience have rated this show. Thank you so much to Joe. Uh, good logic. Uh, we had kind of a discussion and a back and forth about Leviticus the other day um, because uh, his basic perspective was that um, the Bible as written in Leviticus times or Torah as written was applicable today. And I said, well, you know, there's some kind of weird stuff in there. <laughs> like uh, when, it, and the passage I went to was when two men are fighting mm -hmm. and one of their wives intervenes mm -hmm. and grabs the genitals of the other man. Mm -hmm. You're to strike her hand off. As one does. I mean, right. grab the genitals, genitals yeah. not, the, not the striking the hand off. Well, look, I've stopped many fights by grabbing someone's genitals. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it struck me as a weird sort of passage to consider that Okay, wait, if, if Torah is to be taken like 100% literally, how do we not apply this type of teaching today? Or, or, and, and his argument was more that that's supposed to be uh, informative about some other thing, and there must be some other explanation. But um, while, I, while I love Joe, I, I found that uh, explanation a little bit lacking. And, and I think maybe we have we've taken some things from the Bible and, and kind of sculpted them to fit shifting cultural values like we like you said we just don't stone people very often anymore i mean some places do but most christians don't mm -hmm. and and i think i think that happens with every work of literature it could mean one thing at the time it's published and another thing 10 years later when people look back at it and some things have lasting worth but their lasting worth changes over time um and how we look at them tolkien and the lord of the rings um, we look at it differently now because most of the readers who are reading it now didn't live through two world wars right. that completely changed their societies. Tolkien did and his reaction to it. And uh, I happened to be raised, uh, my, my mother died when I was six. So I was raised by grandparents and maiden aunts and they had been born in the 1800s. No, uh, electric light as they used to say no water indoors no flush toilets no pumped water you had you pumped it and you carried buckets and they saw such a huge change in their lifetime mm -hmm. and some of the changes have gone forward and back for instance when i was a young child um people in large cities like london and england could play chess by mail and get three postal deliveries in the same day so they could get a, a postal delivery of their opponent's chess move and over breakfast make the move and decide what they send a, a letter off by lunch get the next move and it, and we go three deliveries a day you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i mean things change over time so inevitably the way we look at any creative thing changes over time the 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 sneering that sometimes goes on amongst younger people when they look at old cgi right of course and they don't realize that this was truly dramatic at the time it was released um not all of it i mean there was always bad movies but i mean there were movies that shocked people in theaters or that you know everybody in the theater would draw breath <gasps> all at the same time when they saw it and nowadays they go oh yeah mm -hmm. and the, the what the story ann mccaffrey used to tell about watching a launch from Cape Kennedy or Cape Canaveral as it now is again. Um, mm -hmm. And she was watching them blast off to go to the moon and she was heard the tears were running down her face and her daughter was with her and said, what's the problem, mom, what's wrong? Because to her daughter who'd been taught in school, we were going to do this and everything and had grown up with a mother who wrote science fiction. Oh yeah, this was old hat. Yeah, of course we're gonna go to the moon. But to right. her mother, it was like, I've waited for this all my life. Yeah, so, uh, I imagine yeah. that'll be that way. If we ever send a, a Mars mission that it has promise of success, we'll be looking at this like, I mean, you and me. I'm not, I'm not terribly old, but I'm not terribly young. I remember watching the Challenger explode on TV. Um, mm -hmm. But it'll be this 
this magnificent and monumental thing. But to someone born now, it's like, no, that's kind of the mission is we're going to eventually push and push and push. But there was a time where we didn't know if we'd ever go back to anywhere other than Earth. I mean, we stopped the moon landings. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think, uh, okay, so going back to this idea of a shifting understanding uh, or a shifting perspective on a literary work from its placement in time to now. And yeah, we definitely kind of have to change how we look at something due to those circumstances. Do you think there is value in reading it presently and reading it in its original sort of setting? Um, or do you think either one of those can be excluded? Uh, inevitably, for most people, one of them has to be excluded because they can't go back to the original time because they're reading uh, a classic, say, that has lasted, sure. like, say, the Bible. Okay. Right. Or, or um, the, the early, uh, we've, most of us have read or, or seen an adaptation of Don Quixote, which was uh, itself a satirization of the romances palm run right. of england and so on um we can't be alive in the time when those books that it was satirizing were out for the first time uh neither can we be alive at the time where um conan or uh the seabury quinn stories all the stuff that um began in the pulps in the weird tales era we're not part of that time we cannot understand the impact of e.e e. doc smith's lensman series a, a space opera that you know we conquer this this huge swath of stars and we fight all these monstrous aliens and it goes on for book after book after book those books were brought out um in they they came out in the pulp magazines but they were so popular they were brought out in leather covered gilt edged with little ribbons as bookmarks at the height of the depression and they were called a history of civilization and they <laughs> sold out <laughs> it's amazing and, <laughs> oh. I love, uh, just a brief aside, I love the craftsmanship of books. Uh, mm. One one thing I just, I kind of despise is with the commercialization of books, which sounds, I mean, that sounds old. So with the commercialization of books, uh, they've we've gotten into these paperback formats with this glossy print cover. And, you know, it, it's very consumable because um, literature has become so disposable. And that's just because it's accessible. I, I think that's all good. Yeah. But uh, when when I find something where they take the time to really take a work and put love into the the creation of the physical product that it's in, it's just, and, and you're describing this leather bound with the ribbons, gilded edges. And it's just mm -hmm. like, those are the books that I want to see on every shelf. Like I want those to be an option for dang near everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I remember watching the first Indiana Jones movie. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in that movie where the two army intelligence officers come to ask um, Indy because he knew this professor Abner Ravenwood, you know. And right. so they, they take him to this empty lecture hall where they talk to him. And at one point they're saying the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, your actual Ark of the Covenant. You know, uh, it's, it, it, well, what does it look like? Oh, there's a picture of it right here, says Indy. And he undoes the huge metal clasps on this giant, <laughs> presumably Bible, you know, and, right. and then flips it open and shows them the engraving of the arc. But it's a, he's undoing the class. And I'm saying, stop, stop the movie. Stop the camera. <laughs> I want to look at that book. Oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> because, right. I, yeah, I love books, too. And, and as you can tell, this is a tiny corner of my writing office. There are 400,000 books in this house and in the two shipping containers in the yard because I have to build more house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a few books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you count them all? Was it estimated? Did you do a bunch of math? Like, did you have like a, a board with like chalk outlines? Oh, like, gosh, no, no. It was like um, when you're boxing them to move. Right. And you do so many running feet and then you just round downwards. So there's probably more than my, it is in the end an estimate, but it's how many boxes in a typical dish barrel, which is what they call a box because it used to be a, a barrel, but never mind, um, right. a particular size of thing. And and when you're young and and limber like I am not now, uh, you can list these huge, heavy boxes full of books. And when you're older, you get tiny boxes of books because you uh, anyway. Um, so I, I <laughs> estimated. But yeah, um, and, and I'm not counting the um, the comic books 
and the right. magazines and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, I love books and I'm surrounded by books and books are taking over the house. And I literally have little aisleways that are just wide enough for my belly to go through. And right now <laughs> I'm doing my wear the heart monitor, which I do every six months. And I, there are aisleways I can't fit through without taking great care because they don't like it when you take their $6,000 heart monitor and smash it along a row <laughs> of bookshelves, you know. <laughs> Run it along these book bindings and see yeah. how it sticks. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, I have to go, oh, sorry, uh, excuse me. <laughs> so going going back to what we were discussing with the um, with the <laughs> idea of... Uh, <laughs> Welcome to tangents. No, that, <laughs> that's where I live, brother. That's oh, where okay. I live. <laughs> yeah, okay. So going back to where, and, and feel free, tangent all over the place. That's, uh, that's the style I want. Because... I have an idea of how to drag out something that I want to hear from you, but I'm much more interested in what you want to talk about and what grabs your attention. So feel free to tangent all over the place, anywhere you feel like it. Um, but I, I do want to go back to this idea of uh, present readings of literature versus past readings of literature. Uh, and particularly with the Bible, I think it's, uh, as it is a belief system, as it is the core of so many people's values, I think it's really important to try and do both. And mm -hmm. And if, 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 uh, I, I mean, I am a Christian. I, I jokingly said to all the Christians earlier, it's just cause I tend to make, I tend to make Christians mad, uh, self-included when I, when I get, um, very, how do I, how do I word when I get skeptical of, of my faith, uh, and challenge it. And, and I don't mean to, but that's just how I examine things. But I think it's critical if we believe it to be an inspired word of creation to, assess that it can have value shift over time within the same text and have uh, truths and, and lessons be extractable and applicable no matter when it is. But I do think it's important to read for the audience that is that it was originally written for. And the Bible itself spans some timeline of somewhere like 1,500 years of writing. Uh, you mentioned it's a great anthology, but it's it's one of the longest running anthologies in our history, if not the longest. And so do you do you think it's, um, I think, I think you mentioned that, uh, you think for most people, they have to cast out one or the other, uh, or they do cast out one or the other. I might, I might've gotten that wrong. Uh, I, I, yeah, I was, I was implying that, uh, we can't read it in its original unless we buy the book brand new when it comes out and therefore right. are for most books, we might be delayed a year and a half or so since the since the writer finished it but we are essentially in the same time and culture but none of us alive today were around when the dead sea scrolls were being written um so we can't possibly know the world and culture of that time we think we do because you know um there have been so many um bible stories for children books over the years but, you know, even that, most of them are depicting uh, the, the figure of Jesus as in their own skin color, their own um, what they think it, somebody looks handsome and noble and, and radiant right. and so on. And, and you'd think, OK, but, you know, if he was of one of these tribes from around there and we know where the Bible said he was born, he would probably have looked a little bit more like this. You know, all these. Right. These these. Arab guys that were labeling that those aren't Christians. Yeah, yeah, that's what he would have looked like, you know. <laughs> but, but I mean, you see, the thing is the and and I don't want to belabor this or or stick just with the Bible. It's the same with everything. We can't necessarily know, and there are many books, and I, and again to step aside from the Bible, um, that explain Sherlock Holmes to us. Mm -hmm. You know, when they say th this passing line in this story, you, know, you have to realize that in Victorian London at this time, blah, 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 blah. And you realize, oh, we've come just enough away from that, that we can get the gist of the story. But some of the individual meanings and and even the meanings of words. Right. And, you, and just to just to pick one off the top of my head, I've read many books that were written. Um, the P.G. Woodhouse and beforehand that are talking about. Um, upper class British wealthy people having fun, and they talk about it. Oh, he was so gay, 
Right. <laughs> and, and it's nothing to do with sexual orientation. And, exactly. Um, it's it the word gay meant something else. And we see it right now with our the young kids say, Oh, that's sick. Meaning that's really cool. That cool is what we would have said in the sixties. In the sixties, sick meant it was terrible. Oh, that's sick. I mean right. you, you hideous, even, disgusting, revolting. Yeah, you, you, uh, you put on this Broadway play and it's just sick. You know, nothing works, it's sad, it's a you know. Uh, it's thin. It looks it looks ill. Um, but to the younger generation, sick is like they're praising it. And and just over that short period of time, a word has changed meaning. So it's really hard if we weren't there when a book was first written. But storytelling shines through. We can still read um, Swiss Family Robinson or Dracula or Robert Louis Stevenson and follow the story, even though. The storytelling may do things that we consider bad storytelling these days, like Swiss Family Robinson, where, you know, so, Father, how is it that our combined strength can move? The and you're going, oh, <laughs> no. uh, it's it's the old, you know, please do not have characters explain to each other things they already know. As you know, Algernon, you know, well, OK, right. well, if Algernon knows that, why are you telling him? Oh, you're telling him for the audience. Thank you. You know, or as you can admire and movie making shows us this because it encapsulated really good info dumps. And that that scene I um, mentioned earlier about Indiana Jones is a really good info dump. Mm -hmm. There's there's a great one at the beginning of 2010, A Space Odyssey, um, that lays out the whole plot and stakes of the movie. But it doesn't sound like two characters are sitting there going, as you know, you know, that th they right. are actually, you know, and it's and the. Uh proverbial show don't tell yeah i don't don't tell me what what there is show it to me and of course movie making allows because of the visual medium the the truth behind the picture is worth a thousand words it mm -hmm. we, we're able to gather so much of it i think a really good kind of modern example of that is um game of thrones where george martin spends so much time in the book going through these very detailed uh uh, visible descriptions of characters and talking about, uh, you know, their dress and the the filigrees on their uh, on their outfits. But in the in the movie, that was up to the job of the you know the costume director and the cinematographer to capture all of that and condense it because otherwise, uh, you know, if we go by page length to time, we would have uh, you know we'd still be on season one uh, mm -hmm. going through that. But uh, the visual medium allows us to sort of gather that that extra exposition that can really spice a book but can also really color a scene on tv mm -hmm. and over time if you just if you ignore um visual media of all sorts and just read books our um our uh, tolerance for a slow pace has ebbed and ebbed and ebbed um the the um Sesame Street, they always talk about uh, attention span and race and bringing things up faster and faster in pace um, can be re you can see it reflected in literature. I, I have read many books that were written, you know, in the 18th century where you think this author is never in a hurry to get anywhere. And and yet. Depending on the quality of the writing and what they're telling you, it can be just as compelling. Oh, this will become a book I really enjoy and savor. And it's going to take me two or three years to get through it. Whereas that jam-packed action book I just picked up at the bookstore, I'm going to read tonight in probably an hour and a half on the edge of my seat, pound, 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 because the pacing is there. And and right. this is one of the things when I first started doing script doctoring, they'd say, um, it flags somewhere about two thirds of the way through. And I said, yeah, you need another chase scene and you need another sex scene. Yeah, but, we, we, we have to stay in the two hour window to get audiences into seats and move. I said, okay, have sex in the car during the chase. There you go. You know, take a... <laughs> and they go, wow, that's why we pay you the big bucks. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, uh, that's reflected in, um, I guess on a shorter timeline though, even in American cinema. And one yes. of the, yeah. one of the ways, uh, or one of the easily demonstrable ways of this, or I guess ways of observing this is watching a modern horror movie versus watching The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. Rewatching The Exorcist is at times a painful labor because the the 
opening 45 minutes is so uh it's brilliantly done it's tension building it's um it's intense but it, it is plodding and methodical and slow yeah. and we kind of really are, have gotten used to hit me with a scare early on uh, give me a break and give me some exposition. Give me some character development. Uh, set the scene. Show me the tropes that are coming that I'm looking for. And then start to get us into the action. Break those tropes that I was expecting. Give me something new. Hit me with the scare, the scare, the scare, the scare. And have the uh, the victor, which is usually the one virgin female, come through and, and deliver the uh, the final blow to the villain. Right? Like that's mm -hmm. it's kind of what we gotten used to. But it used to be uh, in all, all movies are in some way like this it, it used to be such um a more literary approach to that opening uh where we didn't get that and that's that's one thing i i noticed from your um interview with cbr uh that you just did and i i have to say uh no shade to them from you but the publication of the interview was woefully inadequate because <laughs> all they gave uh, in the in the actual article, it was like three lines that you said, and it was really annoying to me um, that that's all because uh, I can't imagine they only asked you three questions. But oh, uh. you mean okay? I have uh, that we, we went for about two hours. Yeah, um, yeah, that. Oh, so, yeah, <laughs> it was a little bit like it's not condensed milk; <laughs> it's condensed, evaporated, dried, and swept away milk with just a couple grains left, but. But uh, I, I did the one line that I, I really thought was important was um, telling the telling the story from the characters' views now, as as we kind of opened with, and so I kind of want to use that as our a lens to drag us back all the way to to this idea of of an evolving storyline for a, a a contemporary setting, and then kind of looking at that going forward. You wrote uh, created the Forgotten Realms. Um, if I'm not mistaken, before you played D and D, you had uh, you had this world building going on, and then you mm -hmm. incorporated it into your actual Dungeons and Dragons playing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was about five years old when I started writing about the realms. Okay, mm. I was one of those child prodigy things, and that means I was writing about the realms about ten years before D and D existed. Right. Okay, and I was doing pastiches of all the stuff. I loved in my father's den, which was all sorts of genres, but I especially loved the fantasy, both high and low, both Dunsany and Conan and everything in between. And during my impressionable teenage years, uh, Roger Zelazny was publishing the Amber series book by book, and Lynn Carter was bringing back into print all of the classics of fantasy in mass market paperback form, which I could afford. And because I'd started working a library so I could get near more books. And I'm guess what? I'm now 63 and I'm still working in the library. I, I have moved library systems as I moved out into the country. But yeah, um, continuously, I've been employed in libraries. So I'm always got books in my. Um, and so, yeah, all of the world. And it was a it was a setting for me to write fantasy short stories so i'd have more fantasy to read right because uh, i continually went to my father with a book i'd found in his library and said where's the next one and more often than not the answer was uh son if you want another one you'll have to write it yourself that author died in 1938 oh okay and i didn't let you know that that old saying about that dang fool didn't know it couldn't be done so we went ahead and did it right yeah you know so i would pound back downstairs to the den where we all had to do piano lessons and we were surrounded by books and my, the card table was set up and my my aunt clara did what all farm housewives and and daughters did you ironed flat all the brown paper bags that you bought groceries in <laughs> and slit them up the sides with a kitchen carving knife and the farmer used that as writing paper you didn't waste money in the d depression on blank right. paper when you could you were buying paper along with your groceries you used the you know, and and so i would write pastiches and that's how i started writing but yeah the the realms was a story world long before D, &D existed so what i used D, D for was i'd already read and devoured all of jack vance's dying earth short stories or all of them that were published at the time and i thought ah this makes magic honest 
rather than a god in the machine um a literary device for for rescuing the story plot because it, it your your spellcasters have limitations and you can see the limitations and when the player's handbook which contained the fancy and magic system with you know jack vance's permission um was added to the monster manual which codified all these monsters both new ones that were really cool and and the ones i knew from mythology and all my reading plus dinosaurs um and put them <laughs> all have dinosaurs one, yeah and you put them all in one book and it was like oh this is really cool um i'll use this as an armature a skeleton for my writing to keep my writing honest in, in the same way that uh, don pendleton when he was writing all the executioner novels actually used to plan out his gunfights just to avoid having people run impossible distances and bash through impossible numbers of doors while firing their their gun too many times right without reloading or stopping or whatever so he wanted to keep them honest so he planned them all through and my my friend and colleague julie trinada who is a award-winning science fiction writer as well as a fantasy writer up in Canada when she wrote her first Merodel fantasy she actually made a model of the village that it takes place in so that when she was writing about people sneaking around at night she would get the angles right who they could see from the back mm. of that house or somebody's garden and not have something impossible happen because she had a a scale model to peer down at and say ah they would see this oh the moonlight would be coming from that direction i could make it all work it's amazing how that translates to um i mean when i when i started playing dungeons and dragons back in i guess junior high and high school uh it was just my friend and i we just you know it was all theater of the mind we didn't we couldn't afford miniatures i didn't even i didn't even know there were miniatures and now like the the sort of miniature uh tile setup or hex tile setup is becoming it, it's kind of coming back and especially with um the integration of the DD &D system into computer games and um uh wizards of the coast big project that they're working on with the new the new D, &D is uh, incorporating the virtual tabletop into that it's kind of getting back to that idea where it's such a boon to storytelling to be able to add this visuality um where uh, I, I think it's tempting to say, well, that'll kind of take away from the storytelling, but in, in a lot of ways, it does help kind of keep it honest. And, and that's one thing I really liked about what you said with the magic system, and we're gonna get to my favorite character in a little bit, um, but, uh, but this, uh, a lot of times when we see magic or supernatural sort of power depicted in popular media, it is this limitless sort of supply. They, they, will sometimes cripple a character with some exhaustion or some sort of risk. But oftentimes you're just like, well, why do they have to struggle for anything? They're just running through and they could just do boom anything out of their way. But uh, the D and D system really does kind of cap that off. I, I mean, wizards ultimately get extremely powerful, um, but it's, it's a long way in. And, and most of these characters are, you know, legendary icons. Um, whereas, uh, Whereas the player characters don't tend to get there until like they can, but it's kind of pointless. I mean, the meat of the campaign happens when they go from like this, this sort of uh, traveling cell sword up to some sort of renowned community or, or greater figure. Mm. But um, can you kind of tell me then about uh, the creation of Elminster? Uh, as, as one of my favorite characters from the D&D setting, was that something that came before the system? Uh, or is that some, uh, when you were writing as a, as a younger child? Or is that something that came later? Elminster was in short stories 10 years before D&D. &D. Um, Elminster was um, a crotchety old wizard. And... Uh, he was Merlin, he was Gandalf, right? But, um, they to say that, and everybody go, Oh, so you ripped him off? No, no, no. What you don't <laughs> understand is that was a trope figure in all of classic fantasy literature going back into the 1400s, right? You have you know? a wizened sage, yeah, uh, who in. 
uh, if you're going back to the Canterbury Tales with Merlin, has he's not only a wise and sage, but he possesses inside him this phenomenal power, which I think is kind of like a metaphorical expression of how powerful knowledge becomes and more maybe more importantly, how powerful wisdom is when it manifests and is able to guide or direct, uh, you know, a, Arthur specifically, like Merlin is advising the king on how to be king with mm -hmm. his uh, with his impossible level of knowledge and experience. Yeah. And um, I was playing with as and people look at me now, you know, the white beard and the long hair and say, oh, yeah, Elminster is Greenwood self insert. No, exactly. They, <laughs> they, they miss the point that I was a nerdy five year old kid with those. They just invented those plastic glasses that were supposed to be unbreakable. Yes. Which made all the guys look like they were wearing librarians' horn rims because that was the only style they came in. Um, and uh, that was me in short pants when I invented Elminster. Okay. So <laughs> he wasn't a self insert because I wasn't yet. I've grown into Elminster, but I wasn't yet Elminster. Okay. But sure. Um, I wanted to play with a couple of ideas that uh, if you live for thousands of years and you lose the country you grew up in, all the people you knew, mm -hmm. all the people you've loved over and over again, that you are, by our measure, insane. Right. And also that absolute power corrupts absolutely, the old saying, and these people have had huge magical power um, burning through them. It's burned out their brains. Again, they're insane. Um, they stay alive in the case of all of the chosen. That's the they. So Elminster, Kelvin, the Seven Sisters, et cetera, et cetera. The chosen um, of, uh, for those uninitiated, the chosen of Mistra, Mistra, Mistra. being the the magical god, the, the goddess of spell weaving of the Forgotten Realms. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, the most powerful deity in the realms. And I realize that in the published realms, they keep trying to downplay that and put Ao over her. And every edition, they kill off Mistra and some other god or, you know, a horse did it. You know, so <laughs> Mistra, Mistra um, um, is therefore not powerful because they're trying to play that down. Um, but when you read the books and you read about the realms oh yeah mistress mistress the because she can cut off access to the weave for everybody right which so is she, it, yeah. uh again for for people who may not be familiar with kind of the D, D magical concept that ed is talking about uh the the weave is the idea of magic it is this this other place of power that uh that wizards sorcerers clerics druids everyone taps into for their spell casting ability no matter if it comes from their arcane studies like in a wizard's case their natural raw power like a sorcerer or their devotion to nature or a chosen deity in the in the idea of a druid or a cleric um all of that is derived from the weave it's just a different way to access it or in the the divine sense for for a, a divine being to grant their followers permission into this or or an avenue a roadway to it so Mistra ultimately controls the entire weave, even for the gods themselves. And if if she is able to shut down, well, there, there was a whole there was a book series where Mistra gets killed, and uh, and it shuts down all magic, all magical access to the weave. And uh, and they there's this long thing to kind of bring a new Mistra into into mm -hmm. being. But um, because the secret is Mistra is the weave. Ooh. So if you kill off Mistra, no more weave. Now, why did the planet not stop turning and all that stuff? Because Mistra's power, because she's so overpowerful, is vested in all sorts of mortals, weave anchors. And weave anchors can be two things. A, a thing that doesn't move, like the Athora, that, which is under Thay, um, this giant magical rock. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that can be a portable thing, like say a, an enchanted crown, an artifact or something that you could move around and it's lots and lots of people. So if you've ever wondered why, say Volo, that idiot, somehow stays alive, it's because he's an unwitting weave anchor. And because he's a weave anchor, 
Azuth and Mistra and all of the Chosen watch over him like guardian angels because they don't want this weave anchor wiped out. So even though he's being a total prat, they keep him alive. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Mistra is the weave. But I feel like that's why I live yeah. sometimes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, you have a guardian angel because you are important. You are the center of the universe. You know this, right? <laughs> I keep telling myself that and other people keep telling me I'm a narcissist, but. <laughs> ah, yes. But you see, narcissism is a matter of style. <laughs> if True. you do it in an endlessly giving way, then you can be the center of the universe and not be a dick. Um, let me rephrase that uh, for the, <laughs> the school children at home. No, <laughs> um, no, there's no, there's no need. School children have been banned from watching the show. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, but but to get back to the Cho uh, Al Minster, I was exploring um, that he's probably insane because of this longevity and all the power, and also because Mister is doing two things to him, and the first thing is follow my dictates and mistress dictates people think of mistra as a goody two shoes she's not her dictate is i want everybody in the world to use magic all the time for everything and i want magic to be accessible to all not tyrants who control wizards and therefore use magic to oppress you right okay um so there's that and then there's the other thing so he's being told to distribute magic so magic so everyone may reap magic that sort of thing but he's also being told you know if you're a really good wizard you know when not to use your power you don't wander around firing off lightning bolts and fireballs at any kid who um you know, raises the middle finger in your direction bow you don't you don't do that because that's a misuse of your power it's bad karma to use another belief system. It will come back to bite you and you will also, you're damaging the world. Right. It's, it's like the guy who takes all the water in the stream and pumps it into holding tanks and everybody downstream has no water. And he says, I don't care about them. I've got it. It's mine. Well, if everybody went like that, um, and which of course is why you have a legal system to avoid having somebody else show up and kill that guy to get their water back, you know, exactly. because otherwise, how would they do it? Uh, how would they, you know, get what they need? And therefore, all of the chosen are in this constant tug of war. Of when do I use my powers? So the young, rash, hot-headed, or desperate wizard may fire off a spell and Elminster will say, uh, you know, that's how you get cataclysms. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows because he's been through them. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the sort of thing I wanted to do with Elminster. And that's now why was Elminster in the realms? Okay. Um, I'm going to have to take you back to before a departed president was president. Back when he was doing something he was good at, the person is Ronald Reagan. Okay. And when he was the narrator of Death Valley Days, mm. at the beginning of every episode, he'd be talking to you like the old storyteller. He says, well, it was a, it was a rough time in the valley this week. And then the camera would go up over his shoulder and into the episode. And right. you'd watch the episode. At the end of the episode, it would come back down. He says, well... How is it going to find it? Oh, oh, well, you'll have to tune in next week to see how it. Okay. Elminster was our unreliable narrator mouthpiece to bring the realms to us. And right. he's, he's doing propaganda for the goddess Mistra. So you can't trust a single word out of his mouth, which gives elbow room for story writers and dungeon masters everywhere to change things in the realms and not have some little squirt sitting at their table who's forgive me, a rules lawyer who goes, who goes, that's not what it says here on page 86. And, and then the dungeon master can say page 86 of what? Well, this book, right? Well, you've never seen that book before. Yes, I have. I bought it at the gaming store. No, no, no. Your character has never seen that book before. Your character doesn't. How does your character know that? Well, well, it says here in the book. Oh, so somebody told you on the street and you believed them. You see, and this right. is the thing. We use the unreliable narrator to give elbow room to everybody to tell the stories they want to tell at the gaming table so you can 
surprise your players, even if they've all bought the player's handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide, or if they bought the adventure that you're running and they think they know because they read ahead, because they pretended they wouldn't, but they did. And Always they do. Know, yeah, and there's going to be a beholder in the next room or um, five dragons mating. And you come around the corner and there isn't. Look, if there's five dragons mating and you're a strong enough wizard, it's time to polymorph and make it six. Yeah. <laughs> or um, as as a, a lady of my acquaintance once said, hi, I'm going to be fleeing now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, I love the un unreliable narrator aspect of, uh, of Elminster. I never really thought of him that way. Uh, so now I've got some rereading to do. But um, one of the one of the settings I um, have been consuming more recently is like the Warhammer 40,000 series. And the entirety of Warhammer 40,000 is premised uh, on the idea that the the Imperial records are incomplete. And so everything you're reading is inherently unreliable. And Bingo. theoretically, that gives them the ability to retcon without retconning things. Yeah. It doesn't quite work, but yes. Right. <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of wanted to, the reason I had started asking about where Elminster came from um, and, and kind of moving into this whole discussion of, of uh, writing being placed in a particular time, it's pretty obvious that D&D &D is going through some cultural questions lately uh, and, and incorporating a lot of, for lack of a better word, political rhetoric or political correctness in it. Do you think that D&D &D is the proper setting for that? Or, or I guess, what are your just general thoughts on that concept of D&D &D, uh, adapting to some people's view of, of popular culture in the present time versus when it was written or, or when the realms were kind of created or brought into this universe? For something to stay relevant and popular, it has to reflect the culture of its time. Um, some of us may remember when Backgammon was big. I don't mean the revival. I mean the original. Right. <laughs> okay, okay. And and yet it is not now. There are classic game forms like Monopoly, chess, and so on, um, that, that stick around regardless. But if you're trying to sell lots of stuff, which let's face it, a, a company publishing in the capitalist world is um and and that it very much includes the current copyright holders of dungeons and dragons they have to keep it relevant the trick for any creative ip is to do it with perfect pacing so you seem to be seamless and it doesn't get noticed that you're changing things because you're in you're in step with the society that hasn't always happened with D&D, &D, and it's very difficult for it to happen because we are trying to capture a new audience of younger generations without alienating the older audience, which is almost never possible. And we have a built-in problem, which, and and I, I can say this because I had this conversation, a much younger me, a nerdy younger me, no beard and everything, <laughs> was having sure. this with Gary Gygax saying, you know, you're missing out. You should have lots of D&D &D books for girls. Mm. And he said, girls don't play the game unless they're girlfriends or wives of the, of the gamers, because he was coming from war gaming, where it was right. almost exclusively men, usually either string bean nerds or overweight and with glasses and pocket protectors and slide rules and, you know, and they leaned over sand tables and they recreated Napoleon at Waterloo or the Normandy landings or ancient Hittites fighting to the death or whatever. And they tried to be simulation of realism and so on. And that's the roots he came from. That was not a woman's world in the same way that model railroading at the time. There may have been lots of female model railroaders, but the perception of the hobby of itself when it navel gazed to look at itself is that it was a man's hobby sort of thing. Um, and in the same, and you're now, because Gary didn't want to provide books for women. And when I started writing novels for TSR, for the realms, first thing I did was Spellfire, 
my first crack at it, young female protagonist. She wants right. adventure. Be careful what you ask for. You know, she got adventure. But I mean, I was deliberately putting strong women in. And some editors loved that. And later on, some editors hated it so much they were changing my female characters to male. Just because we just do, because we don't well, there are too many women in positions of power here. And I had quietly worked in some gay male and gay female couples in just in the background mentioned that so-and-so's um, partner, you know, I would say wife or husband, and you'd say, but that's another girl. But it, but it was not part of the story and it wasn't supposed to be. It was part of the background tapestry. And they would spot that and change them. Oh, no, we can't have that because they were publishing in Wisconsin, in the American Midwest um, at the time. And, you know, they were already ang uh, worried about angry mothers from heck, as they used to call them, um, complaining about D&D &D being, you know, evil devil worship and, and therefore getting it taken out of entire chains of bookstores. And that was the bit that hurt, the entire chains of where you couldn't sell it. Um, right. Yeah, that's D&D. &D, and it's interesting because that's such a product of the time, too. And and one of the there's a key difference between um, writing in I think characters that you want to explore a story for, and trying to lasso an IP in some way and tether it to a political concept and drag the fans along with it. Yes. And and yeah. I think I think there's um, uh, it, it's easy to be very reactionary especially because uh, we grow up and we love these properties. We love these characters. We love these settings. And then we see someone in, in a lot of cases, someone else who didn't create it, uh, who, who maybe didn't even know about it until recently, right? Like they get out of school, they get, they get hired in as, as a writer or character artist or whatever. And they're like, well, I, I, I guess I'll work for this company and draw dragons because dragons are cool, but they don't care about the setting and see them like, rope a political idea and try and drag me into it. But I think there's a distinct difference when you say, well, I have a female character. This is a predominantly male world, but that is kind of what makes this character interesting. Not because I think the world needs strong women characters, but because a woman character dealing with these predominantly male issues uh, is, is a different perspective and something we can go into. And I think there's an honesty and integrity to doing that versus what at least what I seem to be seeing from from Wizards of the Coast these days, when when they come out with, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the kind of the, one of the very famous ones is that orcs are black people, for example. Like, yeah, this, no, this is such a crazy wild assertion. Yeah. yeah, orcs are not human; they are another race. If you want to have racism, you've got it built into the game because elves, dwarves, etc., they right. see things differently. But orcs are not black people. Orcs are orcs not humans of any color of stripe and it, the attempt to paint them in that like if you're saying oh i'm going to use this to tell the story of um emancipation from slavery it's like okay you need to be a more subtle storyteller yeah you're going to you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna lose some of your audience doing it that way and you're going to do a disservice to the people you think you are helping because you're muddying the waters by the style of your storytelling and when I was putting um, lesbian and gay male characters into the background of all my realms fiction, it wasn't to say, look, I'm woke, because woke didn't exist back then. Right. It was, it was, I want you to consider these as a normal part of the setting. And if you look at Tolkien, you will notice that male characters cry, male characters kiss each other, other male characters. And it's not supposed to be gay. It's supposed to be what they do in the culture. And well, Aragorn's to... a little gay. Well, um, <laughs> I, just... I, I never, I never look below the weight. No, uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing: you're supposed to accept it as normal in the culture, right? And and just as we accept when we play Dungeons and Dragons that people can cast spells and stuff shoots out of their hands, and and that that there are gnomes and goblins and orcs and talking trees and so on um we just accept that or well, if you can accept that why can you not accept the fact that you know this or that so i'm trying to put things in so that they be seen as this is just part of the setting this is not something to go look i'm being um you know politically correct it's like no no humans are humans 
we happen to be humans. The, the people who play the game, the people who design the game, the people who write for the game, I hope they're human. Um, <laughs> and therefore, politics is something that humans do. So we're going to have politics in our books. It's just going to be part of it. Accept it. It's part of the human condition. And right. that's the way I'm including things. My inclusivity is to make sure that everybody gets a crack at it so that it isn't just the men that get to rule the woman get to rule that sort of thing and then just go oh okay well, it is uh, i mean it is a fantasy setting so women can run things from time to time uh, oh, oh. <laughs> that's a joke Man, i'm joking the, the, the satirical <laughs> um, yeah mm. no but but see that and that's that's the interesting that is both the interesting advantage and the troubling nature of what i'm find, what i'm seeing in in modern dnd is that and it really annoys me, for example, uh, they took the racial characteristics, which were such an integral part of character creation in second edition, third, fourth, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. original D&D, these, these stat bonuses. And they now said, well, you just take them and, and make them whatever you want and blah, blah, blah. It's like, but we already had the flexibility to do that. But the, the idea is that if you're just playing a dwarf, Mm -hmm. right you're gonna be a little hardier mm -hmm. you're gonna be a little wiser and you're gonna be a little mm -hmm. uglier mm -hmm. um that's how it's gonna be but that doesn't mean like a, a, D, a dm could allow for an exceptionally attractive dwarf or a very uh mm -hmm. or or a very frail one for example if mm -hmm. you um and and that was that was there now they've made it like the point of the thing to eliminate sort of the general race diversity and i think mm -hmm. that really waters down the setting I think it waters down the rulemaking concepts and I think it waters down the exceptionalism that we can infuse into these characters. And, and someone asked me um, when I was doing a, a video D and D campaign, not too long ago, they were like, I'm not really familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. What is it? And I was like, well, one storyteller meets up with like four other storytellers and they all try and tell a more irritating story to each other. And they create something that no one expects. <laughs> and, and if you do that, like you, you have that exceptionalism that kind of gets in there, and you you surprise your DM as much as he surprises the characters, and and I think I feel like that's just getting watered out, and 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 I yeah. hate that that it seems because I'm I'm pure capitalist. I I'm all for the like uh, expansion and, and distribution to a wider audience, but I I feel like if you water something down too much, you mm -hmm. take away what makes it magical. Yeah, and I I think it it's anybody listening to this should not forget why those differences the elves the dwarves the humans were built into the game in the first place and the same reason character classes were built into the game gary was trying to force people to work together the game right. is about working together in groups we can achieve more as a group and trust each other as we go through battles, as we go through danger and keep each other alive or try to, then we do on our own. That was the rule. And the fact that um, you were being taught that it didn't matter if the guy next door looked funny, smelled funny, cooked funny. He was stronger than you, so you needed him. Mm -hmm. And you could trust him and rely on him. And he might, you know, when everybody else in the party, including you, has been killed, he might drag all your bodies out and take them back to the temple for healing because you are now his sword brothers, his friends, his comrades. He depended on you. You are now the family to him. And that was what was built into the game. And although you might say the changes being made now are being done to capture that same thing, they're losing sight of why it was there in the first place. And uh, to older gamers like me, it just seems like also leaving aside all the racial and, you know, because um, I come from Canada. It's a slightly different lens when than it is in the United States. So I can look because we're Canadians are caught forever between the United Kingdom, Britain, England and the United States. So we can look at both of them and go, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's it's just like being outside the room looking in, looking over your neighbor's hedge. Yeah, what your neighbor does sort of thing um we we see these things and go yeah yeah that's not really uh uh oh okay 
but but we can see how battles political battles are being played out but i can also see that D D is so different from one gaming table to another there are gamers who play it like a war game and mm -hmm. you will see them behave like a football quarterback in the huddle they'll have a party caller and the party callers say okay thief um you run around the back and backstab and we'll distract by casting these spells we'll give you a covering fire blah 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 it's almost like a sergeant saying okay we're going into this unknown terrain here's how we do it and then there are other people who want to put on funny monty python voices and ham act everything but that's what my character would do you know um and even though you're going but that's stupid that's silly you're gonna get <laughs> us all killed yeah but right. my character would do that you know and there's everything in between and so we've already got this wonderful diverse game why ruin it it, it ruining quotation marks because the game is always going to change and again to to hit the capitalist nail with the hammer um the company makes money by selling new editions because you have to buy the same rule books over and over again. Um, uh, whereas long-term gamers like me, I've got my world. I created my world. I work on it every day of my life. I've worked on it every day of my life for 55, 56 years now and still going. It's detailed. It's the most detailed world out there. <laughs> and I did that because I wanted my players to have total free reign. They would sit down at my gaming table and in character have a council of war saying, where do you think we should go today? Well, you know, I have to check on the, the cattle we just bought because they all had day jobs and investments and they had relationships in the small village they lived in. So it was like watching a TV sitcom with the same cast of characters when you check in with the or Sesame Street when you check in with Mr. You know, whatever um, you were. They were living in the community. And they were doing all the stuff and it was it was time management what do we do today well i never wanted to be the dungeon master this in this situation of saying the dungeon master wants us to go through that gateway into the ruined castle because i, I see always, the module <laughs> i'm I gonna go the that opposite. way yeah exactly yep. <laughs> and so i wanted to have the whole world detailed so it didn't matter which way they went because then they were truly being the heroes they were acting upon the world rather than the world acting upon them. They were choosing their destinies. They chose where to go. So off you go. And I've got the whole world ready. So if I'm in that situation and the publisher of the game publishes a new edition, and now I have to learn a different way of rolling dice and stuff all over again, and we start right back at the beginning again, and they once again interrupted my tour of the, my grand tour of the realms of giving you every continent and everything and showing you different cultures no no let's just stay in the sword coast but let's get woke about it no 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 Sh let me show you all the other different cultures that are not rip off of real world cultures but my own cultures i've worked hard to develop so they can be different you know but no we can't publish our, any more regional source books because we're changing editions again and it's like right. ah and it's it's frustrating because um, maybe I'm well, I know you can, but maybe you choose to comment on this. Uh, one of the big advantages of fantasy writing or sci fi writing is the ability specifically, at least in my opinion, to remove our current cultural constrictions and ideas, because if we take away the baggage of, say, uh, the racial disparity between blacks and whites in the United States or, mm -hmm. or Hispanics uh, along the Southern border or something like that. If we take that and we, we just say, this doesn't exist as far as this, as far setting. as the setting is concerned, yeah, we can actually remove the political baggage. We can move people, remove people's perceptions, but we can explore those themes by say, having the place where the underdark meets the uh, meets the, the, overworld and see what kind of conflicts come in when those cultural differences of a matriarchal extremely violent society clashes with uh with like a patriarchal society that's a little bit more ordered and not um combat based for example and mm -hmm. and that allows us to explore these very human concepts on our own without being sort of preached to about current settings and and sometimes we get to bypass 
uh, or short circuit our initial reactions and explore things from a new perspective. And uh, it really, it really bothers me when they try and bring in our current setting into these fantasy worlds, because that was the whole point of fantasy was to take it away. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, it, it, it reminds me of an old joke from Flanders and Swan years ago. The purpose of satire is to strip off the veneer of cozy half truth from, and let us see society. And our job is to put it back again. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and and yes, I think I think they have lost their way, but that's my personal opinion. And I am not a company executive and should never run anything because I know I'm not <laughs> good at it. However, like everybody else in any society, the fact that I know I'm not good at it does not remove my right to point at somebody else and saying, and they're not good at it either. And they're in office or they're in charge or they're running that company. Boy, that was stupid. Um, and we all do it all the time. Um, most of us do it the first time we buy a piece of tech and try and read the manual. Oh, my God. You know, it's like, what idiot wrote this? You know, just show me how to use the meep, 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 meep thing. Uh, and, and we are surrounded by bad design and we are surrounded by shortcuts. And yet somebody else could say, well, that's the inevitable of the capitalist system. They managed to, you know, screw you out of some money and they took a shortcut and they got a higher profit. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go next door because I know that fat old man was an executive and I'll shake him down and get some of that money back. Uh, and it, which is, of course, why we have legal system and a society and laws and so on to stop people doing stuff like that because it, it breaks down into might makes right and, you know, can somebody clobber you before you clobber them? And none of us want to live in that situation, which is why we write fantasy stories about it. <laughs> so we can explore it without living through it. Because all of the stuff we do in fantasy things, you know, when a spell horribly changes you or rips your guts and puts them outside your body, you don't want to do that in real life. You don't want to feel what it feels like. Right. And in Fantasy ultimately is uh, an allegorical representation of reality, like like we were discussing, and and um, you know the, the the idea of Elminster being immensely powerful and having this this magic well within him is similar, you know, to very many other popular stories. Spider Man has the adage: "With great power comes great responsibility." I mean, that's Bingo. that's the entire concept, but that's. That's true. And, and when we look at people like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and stuff like that, we can look at their immense capacities for either destructive or, or constructive purposes. And I feel like lately we just get watered down in this, uh, this sort of jealousy or like, look at how much they have. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. look at the capacity they have and let's make sure that capacity that we as uh, in whatever power that we have. And, and a lot of times that's just literally being consumers um, where we as consumers are enabling that capacity. And that, that's our, our power as ordinary people versus their power as, as men who happen to be in an extraordinary circumstance uh, for whatever reason, oftentimes because they're hard work and a whole lot of uh, good fortune. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But speaking of capitalism, Ooh. I have to very quickly uh, announce today's sponsor of the show and then announce that we are going to move off of YouTube and exclusively to Rumble right after that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and remember, if you if you have sent a Super Chat or, or Rumble rant, I will be getting to those a little bit later in the show. But as we go through the interview, I wanted to kind of keep it pure. But I do have an obligation to go ahead and talk about my good friends, Field of Greens, <laughs> fieldofgreens.com. Promo code knows. Look, it's uh, it's organic superfood. It's really easy to eat. You get your bottle of water like this. You get your green powder. It's uh, 10 grams of ground up fruit and vegetables. And that's that's it. It goes in the water. You shake it up. You drink it. You get one serving of fruit, one serving of vegetables. So if you're like me, you eat a lot of meat. You're too lazy to cook vegetables. Uh, or you just don't want to, you know, take the, you know, or you don't want to buy them because you're, you're a capitalist and you hate Walmart or whatever, but uh, <laughs> you shake it up and drink it and that's it. 
that's it, guys. Uh, look, Field of Greens has been a sponsor for a long time. Um, they don't care what I say, what I do, who I talk to, what I talk about. And I love them very much for it. I would encourage you guys to check them out uh, because ultimately they make a good product. And at the end of the day, that's what I care about. Oh, okay. I have one question. Now that you've finished yeah. doing the promo, Absolutely. Do, they, do they do a cheeseburger flavor? They don't yet, but I will recommend it to them. Because, <laughs> you know, if you can feed somebody their fruit and their vegetables and it's not, you know, when you're trying to put the pablum into the kitty's face the, <laughs> out of the jar and the kid is throwing it all over the room and getting it all over you and them. Um, but if they could make it, you know, cheeseburger or fried this yeah. or fried that mm. or, you know, a nice beef roast with the juice pouring out of it and you get that taste when you had your your fruit and vegetables i'd lap the stuff up uh, if i could get it i mean i live in the country um i'm surrounded by um fruit and vegetables they they, they grow on trees you know <laughs> no i've never heard of that <laughs> i live out in the country too but not like i don't i don't want to be by the growing of the things that sounds terrible i just figured they you know they plucked zucchinis off of children or whatever that would be an interesting oh, fantasy yeah. setting, wouldn't it? Mm. Well, yeah, I'm going to be playing in something like that on <laughs> on Saturday. Yeah, uh, veggies, villains, and valuables. That's what it's called. Wow. <laughs> or maybe that's the tagline. I don't know. Um. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, let me uh, <laughs> let me get us off of YouTube, um, guys. If you want to follow us over to Rumble. Uh, it, we are live over there. There is a link in the pinned comments. There is also a link in the description. Uh, we'll be talking more with Mr. Greenwood after this 20 second. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to call you that. We're supposed, we'll be talking more with Ed after this 20 second break. We'll see you guys in just a second. Peace. Peace. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh...